Welcome. For this lecture, we will be talking about forensic odontology, which is a special branch of dentistry. Odontology is a study of teeth and gums and the diseases that are associated with that, especially the anatomy. So what do odontologists do? To become an odontologist, you first of all have to have your dental degree and then specialize in a particular field in training, and usually it's in law enforcement of some type. And a caseload may involve or include all of them. They have to identify human remains uh, that could be from a natural human disaster, such as a bombing. They can assist in police and criminal investigations. And more importantly is the documentation and preservation of bite marks. Because sometimes cases do not go um, in, to court for several years, so they really need to preserve those bite marks um, evidence. So why even study teeth or collect evidence of teeth? when we're talking about forensics. There are four main reasons why we focus on teeth. One is that the human body ages in a similar manner. And we'll look at some examples or images a little bit later. It helps to establish a relative age of a person. It doesn't pinpoint the age, but it does give a range. A second is that most individuals have some type of dental record starting as early as grade school, although throughout adulthood. A third reason is that teeth is the hardest tissue of the human body, and it can withstand a lot of trauma. We're talking decomposition, heat degradation, if it's immersed in water, for example, someone's trying to get rid of a body in the ocean or a lake, uh, desecration, that's extreme dryness or catastrophic conditions. And sometimes if it's an explosion, like I mentioned earlier, or it's been in water for an extended period of time, sometimes that's the only thing that's left of the body are the teeth. And the fourth thing is a source of DNA. If the teeth are the only thing that's left of the human body and there are no other dental records, then we would go into something called the pulp, and we'll look at what that is, part of the teeth. The odontologists will remove the DNA from the pulp, which is inside the tooth, and extract that mitochondrial DNA to help identify the individual. Let's give a little bit of history, how far back this can go. Um, it goes back to 66 AD, and actually the first case was an emperor had his mistress put to death, and so to make sure it was her, he wanted to see her teeth because he knew that she had a discolored front tooth. Um, another piece of interesting history was Paul Revere. We don't usually associate him with forensic dentistry, but he used to make dentures and he would help identify the deceased soldiers of the Revolutionary War. Um, one of the big advancements was in 1849, there was a mass death. 126 people died in the Vienna Opera House fire, and that really prompted, as far as the procedures to identify those people, in writing the first forensic dentistry textbook. I had to include this one. Um, there was this particular burglar, and he went into a home in 1954, and this was the first case where they used bite mark evidence. Anyway, he went in, robbed the house, and I guess he was hungry in the middle of the night or whenever he did this, and he found a piece of lump of cheese and he took a bite and I guess he didn't want it anymore and he left it on the counter and they were able to trace that back to him. They had other evidence obviously, but they used this as a piece of evidence on, to convict him. Okay, we need to talk about a little bit about the structure and function of teeth in order to be able to identify bite marks. I already mentioned it is the hardest part of the body, the tissues. We know that digestion begins in the mouth. First is the chemical, the enzymes breaking down the food and the saliva. The teeth are the actual mechanical to help grind and crush. And the tooth is broken into three regions. The first is the crown, and this is the white part that we see above the gum line. The neck is between the crown and the root, and then the root is what's actually embedded in the bony socket or in your jawbone. The enamel, we're going to look at the layers now that make up the tooth. The enamel is a very hard covering. It's the white portion. Um, calcium carbonate, calcium ph phosphate is what makes it so hard. And so when you eat very acidic foods all the time, your teeth can become very sensitive because that becomes thin. The dentin is the space right here. It's a, a connective tissue. It's calcified, but not as hard as the enamel. And it helps give the tooth its basic structure or shape. The pulp, as I mentioned earlier, is where you would extract the DNA. It's softer than the other two connective tissues, 
and it contains the nerves and blood vessels. So if you have a cavity, um, that hole is going to tap into where all those nerves are at, and that's why it hurts so bad. Okay, <clears throat> now as far as the number of teeth, baby or deciduous teeth, there are 20. Permanent or adult teeth, there are 32. Unless you have your wisdom teeth removed, then you could have 28, possibly. There are four types of teeth. You have your incisors. Here they are blue, top and bottom. They're the four in the front. You have the canines or the cuspids. Those are used for tearing. Those are more of the pink. We'll look here at the top. Then you have the premolars and then you have the molars in the back. Now each type of tooth will vary in size, shape, and the uh, root type. We're going to focus on the crown because that's going to give us the shape and it's going to help to identify the marking of the bite mark to help identify which tooth it is and the characteristics to identify the, who the perpetrator was that bit the individual or left a bite mark in a piece of cheese. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, and you probably already know this, that as we progress from childhood to adulthood, that um, over time, as humans, our teeth come in at different times. So first are our baby teeth, our lower two teeth are going to emerge. So that's our six to nine month teeth right here at the bottom. So once all 20 of our baby teeth come in, then we start losing and getting our adult teeth or our permanent teeth. I thought this was very cool. I had to include this. Um, this is a skull of a child, and let me orient you here just a little bit. So you can see here that this is the actual teeth you would see. The gum jawline is here at this region. Everything above this up here in the face, the upper jaw, those are the permanent teeth. So they have not settled down yet. So this child still has its baby teeth, except here at the bottom. And you'll notice there are no teeth below these three here. These two are the bottom two front incisors and then this tooth, they just lost this tooth and here's the permanent tooth getting ready to come in. So this child is probably between six, seven, or eight years old, maybe first grade. And this is a panoramic x-ray view. It's a little bit harder to see. Um, what I liked about this, it point two particular things. The top is a little bit harder to uh, read, but at the very back, these are the molars, the wisdom teeth. Okay, those are still um, up in the jaw. And here you can see the adult teeth. This really bright, what's really shining, they had some dental work done, probably a cavity. So it would really glow if they had any dental work done. Okay, this is what I was talking about on the standard teeth development. So odontologists can look at um, and give a range. Now it's not going to pinpoint how old they are because you know you may have lost one tooth age five and your friend may have lost at age six the same tooth. So it gives a range especially in children. The older you get then the teeth are going to vary even more. What I found interesting is that even in, in vitro, this is at five months still in the womb, we have what's called little tooth buds. So they're already developing. So this is the jaw right here, so this is the mouth, front of the mouth, and these little dots are the little teeth buds that are coming in. Seven months pregnant, and here is at birth, okay? And then six months, so here are the two bottom teeth that are starting to come in, those are the first teeth to come through. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to bite marks, and that's what we're going to focus on in our lab. Now obviously when you're comparing bite marks to something soft and stretchy like skin, or something hard like a lump of cheese or a pencil, then the outline or the markings are going to be different. So you need to keep that into consideration. Now, bite marks also vary depending if they occur before or after death. So if a bite mark is anti-mortem, which means before death, there's going to be bruising and swelling because there's going to be a blood supply. It's going to break some blood vessels. If it's post-mortem, after death, there's no blood supply, so there's no bruising and no swelling. So the odontologist can tell that this perpetrator bite this individual before or after death. Um, they can also determine, is it an animal or is it a human bite? Humans have a very characteristic horseshoe shape. Animals have a more of a pointed 
shape kind of coming to a point. If you look at your, if you have a pet dog or a cat, you can look at their jaw and determine that. So when an odontologist goes through the steps of analyzing bite marks, now this is after the impressions or casts have already been made. So this is an impression, and we're actually going to do this in class. And I put the teeth up here so we can look at it because we're going to focus on now it's the bite mark, so we're looking at the aerial view, the top of the tooth. Go, keep that in mind. So first thing they do, need to do is determine is it the upper or lower jaw. The upper jaw is always wider than the lower. So the top one, this is the upper jaw, and this is the lower jaw. Okay? Now you might want, it seems a little weird, but you might want to do this as I'm going through this. Take your tongue and kind of feel your teeth as I'm going through this. It makes it a little bit easier kind of counting the back of your teeth and feeling the bottom of your teeth with your tongue so you can feel that. Okay, so the upper four front, so your two front teeth here, okay, those are incisors, they make a rectangle. So see right here, we have two rectangles. Those are your central incisors, okay? Then to the outside, so on the outside here, those are your lateral, they also make a rectangle, but they're not as wide when you compare the two, okay? The lower four are incisors. They also make a rectangle, so one, two, three, four. So if you feel those, okay, those are not as wide as the top four, okay? So you can see the difference between those, but they still make rectangles. Then we move back toward our back of our mouth. The upper and lower cuspids or more round and oval because they're used for tearing. So you can see here that that's a cuspid, it's kind of a round oval, and the same thing with this one. Okay, the sharper the cuspid, the more round it's going to be. Now it's not showing on this, we're kind of missing some other teeth because of the bite mark, um, but let me pull this other image up. If we were able to get all the way back into the molar area, which if you look here, it's a more of a square tooth, and the top of the tooth, it's a grinding tooth, so that's the function of it. So it's going to have little points that come up, and so the top tooth is going to fit so that it can grind the food between it. So when it makes an impression, you're going to have three or four dots in the impression. But it's rare that you get all of the teeth imprints because you'll find in lab it's hard to get something way back in the back of your jaw to bite down on it. There's usually something in the way or just the limitations of your jaw or the corners of your mouth will limit that. Okay, the next thing they're going to look at once they determine the teeth, they're going to look at the bite mark itself. They're going to look for a pattern. They're going to look for tooth mark size. Then they're going to start measuring, and you're going to do this also. So they're going to look at the arch. They're going to measure between the molars and the incisors, and they'll go from a molar to the incisor or a molar to a canine, and they're going to get some ratios and measurements to determine how wide the jaw is in the bite mark. And then they're going to do a comparison between the victim's teeth and the suspect's teeth. Okay, so some characteristics they're going to look at besides all of the measurements. Um, unlike fingerprints, as you move through life, your, your teeth are going to change, whereas your fingerprints do not, not drastically. You may have a little cut over it, but they really don't change. It depends on your activity, your health, whether you go to the dentist regularly or not. There's a lot of factors on how your teeth uh, develop over the years. So things that really help odontologists identify a perpetrator is do they have dental alter alterations, fillings, caps, dentures. So we all know what fillings are. Um, these are with the um, metal and now they have composite which is more tooth-like. So you can still see them in the x-ray. Um, they still shine but you just can't see it in visible light. Teeth, the size and the shape, any gaps, cracks, alignment. Um, whether they had braces or not, missing extra teeth, I know it seems a little weird, any stains like on the emperor that killed his mistress to make sure that it was her, the stain on her tooth, and then if there's any irregularities in the jaw, maybe they had their bro uh, jaw broken in an accident, so that would make it a misalignment of the jaw and the bite mark and that would have a particular wear pattern on one side. And finally, dentition is the pattern 
that a set of teeth make when it does a bite mark. Um, you'll notice these numbering, and this is what the dentist will use, uh, something similar to this. Now they have software, um, but they will go through, they have a universal system, and they number teeth. So adults have a numbering system, 1 through 32, and children that have, for the primary teeth, have a lettering system, A through K. So they have 20 teeth. And so down here at the bottom, any work that's been done, they will make with symbols, they will mark it on there. So an X means that that tooth has been missing or extracted. Um, they'll make a mark if there's been a filling or a cap, or if there's a misalignment, they'll draw a line through it. So we'll do that in lab also. And the good thing is these records are kept forever. And if it's a missing report, missing persons, um, they actually goes to a particular office that that is kept on file. Um, until that individual is found or the case has been solved. So these the odontologists will compare both the anti and the postmortem records. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting. There were a lot more graphic, believe me. Um, but this is an artificial tooth that they actually did an implant. So this is into the actual jawbone, and then they screw the tooth in, and so now they have what looks like a normal tooth, but you wouldn't know it's an implant until you take an x-ray of it. So that is helpful in identifying an individual. The other good thing about this is like dentures and implants, they have serial numbers. So that can be tracked also. So that's on record. Um, so I've already mentioned implants, dent bridge work, and all that. We've already saw a portion of this image. I crop this out so we can look at the molar imprint. Um, like I said earlier, it's very rare to get a full imprint because things get in the way. Clothing can get in the way uh, when you do a bite mark. Uh, what they will do, you'll, you've seen this scale before. This is a photo scale, and they always do a one-to-one -one ratio because if they do a cast, they have to have it exactly right in order to match it up perfectly. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. They have The pieces have to match up perfectly, so it has to be a one-to-one -one scale. They will take both color pictures, black and white photos, so they can look at the contrast. Now, you notice here that there's a lot of bruising, so that's anti-mortem. So this individual was bitten by the perpetrator while they were still alive. Okay, so this is the cast I was talking about. So this is of the perpetrator, and so you can see they're aligning the bite mark up to see if it matches. Um, they take an impression if there are not enough um, deep enough impressions. A cast is if there's more of a puncture wound that they can get the median down into it to actually lift out um, a cast from it. So usually they do uh, transparency tracings. And then they'll compare the two and take into consideration any swelling inflammation from the bite mark. Now, with the advancements, just like fingerprints a long time ago, we didn't have a database. Um, but now, with, through technology, we now have a database that we can go to, the CODIS, that we can identify suspects. And we're getting there with odontology. So what they'll do is they're starting the process where they will start scanning in, looking for matches. And right now, it's called an odonto search. And they'll compare the database of missing people, felons, and government workers. So that's where they're starting now. And so what it will do is they will scan in the dental cast and then make a 3D image of it and then sh you know save that rather than trying to save and preserve all of these casts that they've kept for years and years. Because some of these cases can go unsolved for 20, 30 years. So if we have it digitally, it makes a lot more sense. One other thing that odontologists do, unfortunately, is that they have a Jane or John Doe come in, um, a skeleton, and they can't find any dental records on the individual. One thing that they do, they work with a forensic artist. That may be another field you might be interested in. And they will help produce a picture of some general features based on the teeth and how they are in the skull. Um, it gives ethnicity, the age if it's a child, the sex, because the jaws are different males and female, based on dietary habits. Dental disease, it can kind of give a range of their socioeconomic status. Um, this case, I'm not familiar with. I couldn't find anything on this, but I like the pictures because I don't know if you can see these little things sticking off the skull. These are like um, depth skin markers. And what it will do, 
based on their ethnicity, male or female, um, the artist, if they're using clay, can make a sculpture or a bust of the individual. Uh, for this particular one, they did a drawing, and here's the woman. This is a missing person, but I don't know the case. Um, so anyway, based on the drawing, they publicized it through the news, and they were able to find her. This one, this is a very sad case. I'm not going to go into it. It is really sad. If you're interested, you can go online. Um, in 2001, this was here in Kansas City. Her name was Precious Doe. Um, part of her was found in Kansas City. Um, and anyway, basically what had happened is it, several years went by. They could not identify this child from the teeth and the dental work and the forensic artist and the odontologist um, on the right is a bust that they created. And then once they spread that out across the nation, they were able to find who this little girl was. Um, and so they were able to identify that Precious Doe was Erica Green. Okay, I want to save this one for last. I could have added this with the history information, but when I think of bite marks and forensics, this case always comes to mind. This is about Ted Bundy. I don't know if you've heard about him. He's an American serial killer. Um, he murdered several young women between 1974 and 78. There was no evidence of who was committing these murders. Just by random chance, a police officer stopped Bundy for a traffic violation. And while in custody, he admitted to committing some of these uh, crimes and then he escaped. And while he had escaped, he killed two more women. He had a very unique bite mark and the bite mark along with other evidence he had left this behind on one of his victims and it helped lead to his conviction and finally his execution so it was very vital in um, bringing him to justice so this kind of wraps up odontology we will do a lab on bite mark identification we'll start with your own bite marks and then we'll do a little mystery associated with that so if you have any questions, just see me in class.